Saffron spread her saffron mantle over the world. Zeus, who delights in thunder, called the gods to a conference on the highest of Olympus's many peaks. He opened it himself, and all attended carefully. Listen, you gods and goddesses, while I tell you what I've resolved. He said, I'm determined to bring this business to a speedy close. And with that end in view, I give you my ruling, which no god or goddess must defy. You must accept it, every one of you. If I find any god taking an independent course and going to the Trojans or the Danaeans' help, he shall be trashed ignominiously and packed off to Olympus. Or I will seize him and hurl him into the gloom of Tartarus, far, far away where the deepest of all chasms yawns below the world, where the iron gates are and the brazen threshold, as far below Hades as the earth is under heaven. That will teach him by how much I am the most powerful of all the immortals. But perhaps you gods would like to put me to the test and satisfy yourselves? Suspend a golden rope from heaven and lay hold of the end of it, all of you together. Try as you may, you will never drag Zeus, the High Counselor, down from heaven to the ground. But if I cared to take a hand and pull in earnest from my end, I could haul you up, earth, sea, and all. Then I should make the rope fast to a pinnacle of Olympus and leave everything to dangle in mid-air. By so much does my strength exceed the strength of gods and men. Zeus finished, and they all held their tongues. He had spoken with tremendous force and left them dumbfounded. At last, Athene, goddess of the flashing eyes, spoke up. Father of ours, son of Kronos, Lord Supreme, she said, we all know well enough that you are invincible, but we are sorry, nonetheless, for the Danan spearmen left as they will be to destruction and miserable fate. However, we will refrain from fighting, as you say, and shall content ourselves with giving helpful advice to the Argives, so that they may not come to grief through your anger. Zeus the cloud gather smiled at her as he replied. Have no fear, lady of Trito, and dear child of mine. I was not in earnest, and I do not mean to be unkind to you. Zeus then harnessed to his chariot his two swift horses with their brazen hooves and flowing golden manes. He clothed himself in gold, picked up his splendid golden whip, mounted his chariot, and started the horses with a flick. The willing pair flew off on a course midway between the earth and starry sky and brought him to Gargarus, a peak of Ida of the Many Springs, the mother of wild beasts, where he has a precinct and a fragrant altar. There the father of men and gods pulled up his horses, freed them from the yoke, and wrapped them in a dense mist. Then he sat down on the heights, exulting in his glory and looking out over the Trojan city and the Achaean ships. Meanwhile, the long-haired Achaeans ate a hasty breakfast in their huts, and forthwith armed themselves. While on their side, in the city, the Trojans also prepared themselves for battle. There were fewer of them, yet, for all that, they were eager to grapple with the enemy, driven as they were by the stern necessity to fight for their wives and children. The gates were all thrown open, and with a great din, their whole army, infantry and horse, poured out. Thus, the two converging forces met once more with a clash of bucklers, spears, and bronze-clad fighting men. The bosses of their shields collided, and a great roar went up. The screams of the dying were mingled with the taunts of their destroyers, and the earth ran with blood. Right through the morning, while the blessed light of day grew stronger, Volley and countervolley found their mark, and men kept falling. But at high noon, the father held out his golden scales, and putting sentence of death in either pan, 
On one side for the horse taming Trojans, on the other for the bronze clad Achaeans, raised the balance by the middle of the beam. The beam came down on the Achaean side, spelling a day of doom for them. Their sentence settled on the bountiful earth, while that of the Trojans went soaring up to the broad sky. Zeus thundered out from Ida and sent a flash of lightning down among the Achaean troops, who were confounded by it. Terror drained the color from the cheeks of every man. Then, neither Idominus nor Agamemnon had the heart to hold his ground, nor did the two Ajaxes stand, henchmen of Ares though they were. Gerenian Nestor, warden of Achaea, was the only one who lingered, and that not of his own free will, but because his third horse was in trouble. Prince Paris, Lady Helen's husband, had hit him with an arrow on the top of the crown, where the mane starts to grow on a horse's head, a very deadly spot. In his agony, he reared, for the point sank into his brain, and writhing round the dart, he threw the other horses into confusion. Nestor rushed in with his sword and was slashing at the outrigger's reins, when Hector's horses came galloping up through the turmoil with a redoubtable charioteer behind them, Hector himself, and the old man would then and there have lost his life, but for the quick eye of the veteran Diomedes, who saw the danger and gave Odysseus a resounding call for help. My noble lord Odysseus, he shouted, where are you off to with your shield behind you like a coward in the crowd? Careful as you flee, my lord, someone might catch you with a spear. For heaven's sake, stop and help me keep savage Hector off the old man there. But the much enduring noble Odysseus did not hear him and sped by on his way to the Achaeans' hollow ships. Thus, left to his own resources, Diomedes nonetheless drove up to the point of the attack, posted himself in front of Nestor's chariot, and brought reassurance to the old king. These young warriors, he said, are proving too much for an old man like you, my lord, with all those years to carry. You are clearly spent. That squire of yours is useless, and your horses are slow. Come, get into my chariot, and you will see what the horses of Tros are like, how quickly mine can cover the ground, in flight or in pursuit. I took them from Aeneas only the other day, these fighting stallions. Let our squires take charge of your horses, while we drive this pair at the Trojans, and teach Hector that I too have a spear. Nestor the Drenian nobleman was nothing loath. So their two gallant squires, Stenelus and the gentle Eurymedon, took charge of Nestor's horses, while he and Diomedes both mounted Diomedes' chariot. Nestor took up the polished reins and started the horses with a the whip. They were soon within range of Hector, and Tydeus' son let fly at him as he came charging up. He missed him, but instead got Hector's squire and charioteer, Aniopius, a son of the proud Thebacus. He hit him by the nipple on his breast with the horse's reins in his hands. The man fell headlong from the car, making his horses shy, and died where he fell. The death of his charioteer wrung Hector's heart, but sorry as he was for his comrade in arms, he left him lying there and went off in search of another dashing charioteer. His fast horses were not long without a driver. He soon found the daring Archiptolemus, if it is his son, made him get in behind the pair and handed him the reins. Irreparable disaster threatened the Trojans now, and they might have been driven into Ilium as lambs into a pen if the father of men and gods had not been alert and acted quickly. With a terrific thunderclap, he launched a dazzling bolt and guided it to earth in front of Diomedes' horses. The dreadful reek of burning sulfur filled the air. The horses shied and backed under the chariot. The polished rein shook in Nestor's hands, and in his terror he turned to Diomedes and said, My lord Tydeides, wheel your horses round and fly. Do you not see that you can expect no help from Zeus? At the moment, the son of Kronos is allowing Hector there to carry all before him. But only for the day. Another day our turn will come, if he is kind. 
However bold a man may be, he cannot run counter to the will of Zeus, who is far more powerful than we are. All that, sir, is very true, said Diomedes of the loud war cry. And yet it cuts me deep to think of Hector holding forth, saying to the Trojans, Diomedes ran from me. He didn't stop before he reached the ships. He is sure to brag like that. And when he does, may the earth swallow me whole. What nonsense, my dear sir, from the son of the fearless Tydeus, replied Gerenian Nestor. Hector can dub you coward and milksop to his heart's content, but he will not convince the Trojans and Dardanians, nor those proud spearmen's wives whose loving husbands you have flung down in the dust. With no more said, he wheeled the horses round and drove them back in flight across the route. Hector and the Trojans followed them up with a terrific roar in a hail of deadly missiles. And the great Hector of the Glittering Helmet raged a shout of triumph over Diomedes. Tydides, he cried, the Danaean horsemen used to honor you with the best seat at the table, first cut of the joint, never an empty cup. They will not think so well of you today. After all, you are no better than a woman. Off with you, wretched fugitive. No cowardice of mine is going to let you climb our walls or carry off our women in your ships. I shall see you off to Hades first. Tydides, when he heard this, had half a mind to turn his horses round and meet Hector face to face. Thrice he was on the point of doing so, and thrice the counselor Zeus thundered from Mount Ida as a sign to the Trojans that victory was theirs with help from him. And there was Hector, calling aloud to his men. We Trojans and Lycaeans, and you Dardanians that like your fighting hand to hand, be men, my friends. Do justice to your valor. I am convinced that Zeus is on my side. He has assured me of a triumphant victory and a disaster to the Danaeans. Fools that they are to have gone and made those flimsy, futile walls, which will not hold us up for an instant. As for the trench they have dug, our horses will jump that with ease. And once I get among the ships, let your watchword be FIRE! I want to see those ships go up in flames, and the Argives lurching about in the smoke and falling dead beside the halls. Hector then turned to his horses, called them each by name, and talked to them. Xanthus, and you Podargus, Ethan, and my noble Lapis, repay me now for the attentions lavished upon you by Andromache, a great king's daughter who has always hastened to put honeyed wheat before you and makes you wine to drink at your pleasure before she thought of serving me, who claims to be her loving husband. After them now, at a gallop, and let us capture Nestor's shield. The talk of the heaven itself, of solid gold, they said, shield, bars, and all. Or tear the inlaid breastplate that Hephaestus made for him from the shoulders of horse-taming Diomedes. If we could lay our hands on those two pieces, I should hope to make the Achaeans take their fast ships this very night. Hector's vainglorious tone was resented by Lady Hera. And with an impatient movement on her throne, which made High Olympus quake, she turned to the great god Poseidon and said, Imperial Earthshaker, I am distressed to see that even you can find no pity in your heart for the Danaeans in their downfall. Yet, at Heliki and E.G., they make you many pleasing offerings. Can you not bring yourself to wish them victory? Why, if we who are on their side made up our minds to keep all-seeing Zeus from interfering and to thrust the Trojans back, what a sorry god he would be, sitting alone there on Ida. Hera, these are wild words indeed, replied the lord of the earthquake with the utmost indignation. Even from your unruly tongue. Far be it from me to join the others in a fight with Zeus, the son of Kronos, who is so 
much stronger than us all. While well, these two were talking to one another, the whole enclosure between the ship's entrench by the wall was filled with a medley of chariots and armed men, penned in like sheep by that peer of the impetuous war god, Hector, son of Priam. Now that Zeus had given him the upper hand. Indeed, he would have had the trim ships alight and going up in flames if the Lady Hera had not put it into Agamemnon's head to bestir himself and rally the Achaeans before it was too late. He went along past huts and ships with a huge purple cloak gripped in his great hand and climbed up on the bulging black hull of Odysseus' ship, which stood in the center of the line, so that a man's voice could carry to either end, to the huts of Telamonian Ajax, or to those of Achilles, who had the confidence enough in their own bravery and strength to draw up their trim ships on the extreme flanks. From this point, Agamemnon sent his voice ringing out to the whole Danaean army. For shame, Argives! She cried, contemptible creatures, splendid only on parade. What has become of our assurance that we were the finest force on earth? What are the idle boasts that you made that time in Lemnos as you gorged yourself on the beef of straight horned cattle and drank from bowls brimful of wine? You said that in a fight you could each stand up to a hundred, nay, two hundred Trojans. Whereas today, the whole crowd of us are no match for Hector alone. And he, before long, will have the ships going up in flames. Father Zeus, was a great king ever fooled by you like this, and robbed of all his glory? Yet I can claim that on my unhappy journey here in my ship of war, I never overlooked a single one of your fine altars. On every one of them I burnt the fat and thighs of bullocks in my eagerness to bring down the walls of Troy. Ah, Zeus! Grant me this prayer at least. Let us escape with our lives, if nothing else, and do not let the Trojans overwhelm us like this. Thus, Agamemnon prayed, and the father was moved by his tears. With a nod of his head, he vouchsafed him the salvation of his army, and at the same time sent out an eagle, best of prophetic birds, with its talons in a fawn, the offspring of some nimble doe, the eagle dropped the fawn by the splendid altar of Zeus where the Achaeans used to sacrifice to the father of oracles. And when they realized that the bird had come from Zeus, they fell on the Trojans with a better will and recalled the joy of battle. Then, not one of the many Danaean charioteers could boast that he had raced Diomedes to the trench and had driven out before him to engage the enemy. Diomedes was certainly the first to kill a Trojan man-at-arms. His victim, Aegilus, son of Phradmon, had swung his horses round for flight. He had no sooner wheeled than Diomedes caught him in the back with his spear, midway between the shoulders, and drove it through his breast. He crashed from his chariot, and his armor rang about him. Diomedes was followed by the Atreidae, Agamemnon and Menelaus, these by the two Ajaxes, dauntless and resolute. And these again by Idominus and Idominus' squire Meriones, a peer of the man-killing war god. And these by Eurypylus, Euaemon's noble son. The ninth Thessaly out, bending his recurved bow, was Teucer, who took his usual place behind the shield of Ajax, son of Telamon. Ajax would slowly move his shield aside. Teucer would peer about for a target in the crowd and shoot. Then, as the man he hit dropped dead, Teucer, like a child running for shelter to its mother's skirts, took cover once again with Ajax, who hid him under his glittering shield. Who was the first of the Trojans to fall to the peerless Teucer? Orsilicus, then Orminus, then Ophelestes, Dator, and Chromius, and the godlike Lycophontes, and Amopaeon, Polyamon's son, and Melanippus. All these in swift succession he brought down onto the bountiful earth. Agamemnon, king of men, was delighted when he saw what havoc Teucer was making in the Trojan ranks with his strong bow. He went up to him and said, Teucer, son of Telamon, my beloved prince, shoot on as you are doing now, and you may well bring salvation to the Danaeans and fame to your father Telamon, who took you under his roof and reared you, though a bastard child. 
Repay him now with glory, far away as he is, and I tell you what I undertake to do. If Aegis bearing Zeus and Athena ever let me sack the lovely town of Troy, I will hand you the first price of honor after my own, a tripod, or a pair of horses with their chariot, or a woman to share your bed. My noble lord Atreides, said the admirable Teucer, why flog a willing horse? I've been doing all I can without rest. From the moment when we thrust him back towards town, I've been watching for chances with my bow and picking men off. I shot eight long barbed arrows, and each has found its mark in the flesh of some fighting youngster over there. But there is a mad dog whom I can't hit. As he spoke, he aimed at Hector, whom he yearned to bring down, and sent another arrow flying from his string. He missed him, but the arrow landed in the breast of one of Priam's noble sons, peerless Gorgithion, whose mother, the lovely Castanera, with a figure like that of a goddess, had come from Asymi to be married to the king. Weighed down by his helmet, Gorgithion's head drooped to one side, like the lolling head of a garden poppy, weighed down by its seed in the showers of spring. Once more, in his eagerness to get him, Teucer aimed at Hector and sent an arrow flying from his string. He missed him this time too, for Apollo turned his dart aside, but he hit Archiptolemus, Hector's daring charioteer by the nipple on his breast, as he was galloping into the fight. He crashed from his chariot, making his horses shy, and died where he fell. The death of his charioteer wrung Hector's heart, but sorry as he was for his comrade in arms, he left him there and called upon his brother Sobrines, who happened to be near, to take the horse's reins. Sobrines heard him and obeyed. Hector himself leapt to the ground from his resplendent chariot with a terrible shout, picked up a lump of rock, and made straight for Teucer whom he was determined to kill. Teucer had just taken a sharp arrow from his quiver and put it on the string. As he drew back the string and aimed at him, Hector of the Dashing Helmet struck him on the shoulder with the jagged stone on the weakest spot, where the clavicle leads over to the neck and breast. The bowstring snapped. His fingers and wrists were numb. He sank down on his knees, and the bow dropped from his hand. But Ajax did not disregard his brother's fall. Running up, he bestrode Teucer and covered him with his shield. Then two of their trusty men, Mecisteus, son of Echius, and the noble Alastor, lifted him from the ground and carried him off, groaning heavily to the hollow ships. Olympian Zeus now put fresh heart into the Trojans, and they drove the Achaeans right back into their own deep trench. Hector, relentless and elated, led the van. Like a hound, in full cry after a lion or a wild boar snapping at flank or buttock and following every twist and turn, he hung on the heels of the long-haired Achaeans, killing the hindmost all the time as they ran before him. They fled across the palisade and trench, suffering heavy losses at the hands of the Trojans, and they did not stop till they reached the ships. There they halted, calling to one another for help, and every man lifted up his hands and poured out prayers to all the gods. But there was Hector, wheeling his long mane horses to and fro, and glaring at them with the eyes of Gorgo or the murderous war god. The white-armed goddess Hera was sorry for them when she saw their plight, and did not conceal her distress from Athena. Daughter of Aegis bearing Zeus, she said to her, Can you and I look on without a final effort while the Danaeans perish? For that they will, and miserably too, mowed down by a single man. See what Hector has done to them already. And now there is no stalking him in his mad career. Nothing could please me more, said the bright-eyed goddess Athena than to see that mad career cut short and have him killed on his native soil by the Argive's hands. But my father is in a wicked mood, 
obstinate old sinner that he is, always meddling with my plans. He never thinks of the many times I went to his son Hercules' rescue when he was defeated by the task Eurystheus set him. Hercules had only to whimper to heaven, and Zeus would send me speeding down to get him out of his difficulties. In my prophetic heart had warned me of all this when Eurystheus set him down to the house of Hades, warden of the gates, to bring the hound of hell from Erebus. He would never have recrossed at cataracts of Styx. But now Zeus hates me and is letting Thetis have her way because she kissed his knees and touched his chin with her hand when she begged him to support Achilles, sacker of towns. However, the day will come when he will call me his darling of the flashing eyes once more. Meanwhile, will you get our horses ready? while I go to the palace of Aegis-bearing Zeus and arm for war. I want to see how pleased the son of Priam, Hector of the Flashing Helmet, will be when we show him ourselves athwart the ranks. It is now the Trojans' turn to fall dead by the Achaeans' ships and glute the dogs and the birds of prey with their fat and flesh. To this... The white-armed goddess made no demur. So Hera, queen of heaven, and daughter of the mighty Kronos, went off to put the golden harness on her horses. Well, on her father's threshold, Athena, daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, shed the soft embroidered robe, which she had made with her own hands, and put on a tunic in its place, and equipped herself for the lamentable work of war with the arms of Zeus the Cloud Compeller. Then she stepped into the flaming chariot, gripping the huge, a long spear with which she breaks the noble warrior's ranks when she, the Almighty Father's child, is roused to anger. And no sooner was she in than Hera started the horses with her whip. The gates of heaven thundered open for them of their own accord. They are kept by the hours, the wardens of the broad sky and of Olympus, whose task it is to close the entrance or to roll away the heavy cloud. Through these gates, the goddesses drove their patient steeds. When Father Zeus saw them for Mida, he was enraged, and had at once told Iris of the Golden Wings to convey a message to them. Off with you, Iris, as fast as you can, he said. Make them turn back. Do not let them meet me face to face. It would be a terrible thing for them to fight with Zeus. Tell them from me, who make no idle threats, that I will hamstring the horses they are driving, hurl them both from their chariot, and break the chariot up. Ten rolling years would pass, and they would not be healed of the wounds my thunderbolt would deal them. That will teach the Lady of the Flashing Eyes what it means to fight against her father. As for Hera, I'm not so much hurt and angered by her. It is her instinct to defy me. Iris of the Whirlwind Feet sped off on her mission from the peaks of Ida to Great Olympus, and there, on the rugged heights of Olympus, she met the two goddesses at the very gates, stopped them, and delivered her message from Zeus. Where are you going? She said. What is the object of this mad adventure? The son of Kronos forbids you to assist the Argives. Hear what he threatens. And you know that Zeus keeps his word. He will hamstring the horses you are driving, hurl you both from your chariot, and break the chariot up. Ten rolling years would pass, and you be left still suffering from the wounds his thunderbolt would deal you. That lady of the flashing eyes will teach you what it means to fight your father. It is not Hera who habitually defies his orders, that has hurt and angered him so much, as you and your graceless, brazen impudence, if you really dare to brandish that great spear of yours at Zeus. Her message delivered, Iris of the Fleetfoot took her leave, and Hera turned to Athena in alarm. Daughter of Aegis-bearing Zeus, she said, 
I have changed my mind. We too will not go to war with Zeus on man's behalf. Let chance settle who is to live or die. Zeus must decide in his own mind between the Trojans and the Danaeans, as is only right. As she spoke, she turned their chariot back. The hours unyoked their long-maned horses for them, tethered them at their ambrosial mangers, and tilted the chariot against the burnished wall by the gate, while the two goddesses rejoined the other gods in great chagrin and sat down on golden chairs. Meanwhile, Father Zeus had left Ida, and was driving his fast chariot and horses to Olympus. He, too, was served when he reached the home of the gods. The illustrious earthshaker unyoked his horses and put his chariot on its stand and covered it with a cloth. All-seeing Zeus himself sat down on his golden throne, and great Olympus quaked beneath his feet. Athena and Hera, sitting by themselves, away from Zeus, said not a word to him and asked him nothing. But he knew what was passing through their minds, and he said, Athena and Hera, why are you so dejected? Not worn out, surely, by the glorious battle in which you killed so many of the Trojans whom you loathe? I, now, could never be turned from my path by all the gods and Olympus, such as the strength of my unconquerable hands. But you two were trembling in every limb before you even saw the battlefield and its horrors. Let me tell you what would have happened if you had not changed your minds. My thunderbolt would have wrecked you, and if you had gone home to Olympus, it would have been in someone else's chariot. This sally drew mutterings from Athena and Hera, where they sat together still plotting trouble for the Trojans. However, Athena held her tongue for all her annoyance with her father Zeus. She made no rejoinder, though she seethed with indignation. But Hera could not contain her rage and burst into speech. Dread son of Kronos, this is intolerable. We know as well as all the rest that your powers are not to be despised. But we cannot help being sorry for the Danan spearmen, left as they will be to destruction and a miserable fate. However, if it is your wish, we will refrain from fighting and content ourselves with giving sound advice to the Argives, so that they may not all come to grief through your anger. To this, the cloud compeller Zeus replied, Hera, my oxide queen. You will have the opportunity at dawn tomorrow of seeing the almighty son of Kronos do greater execution yet among the spearmen of the Argive force. For I tell you that the mighty Hector is going to give his enemies no rest till swift Achilles comes to life again beside the ships, when they are fighting at the very sterns, in desperate struts, over the body of Patroclus. That is decreed by heaven. As for yourself, your annoyance leaves me calm. For all I care, you can go to the bottomless pit and join Iapetus and Kronos, who never enjoy the beams of Hyperion the sun, nor any breezes, sunk as they are in the depths of Tartarus. You can descend as far as that, and your anger will still leave me unconcerned. There are no limits to your impudence. This time, the white-armed goddess Hera said not a word in answer. And now the bright lamp of the sun dropped into ocean, drawing black night in its train across the fruitful earth. The Trojans had not wished the day to end, but to the Achaeans, who had yearned for this relief, the dark came like a tardy answer to their prayers. Illustrious Hector withdrew the Trojans from the ships and summoned a meeting in an open space beside the swirling river where the ground was clear of corpses, and they got down from the chariots to hear what the king's son had to say. He had a spear eleven cubits long, the bronze point glittered in front of him, and there was a gold ring round the top of the shaft. As he addressed his troops, he rested his weight on the spear. 
Trojans. He said. Dardanians and allies. Listen to me. I had hoped to destroy the ships and all the Achaeans with them before going home to Windy Ilium. But the light failed too soon. It was that more than anything that saved the Argives and their fleet on the seashore. Now we can only do as night suggests and prepare for supper. Unyoke your long-maned horses and put fodder by them. Then quickly go and bring some cattle and fat sheep from town and supply yourselves with mellow wine and bread from your houses. Also, collect a quantity of wood so that you can have plenty of fires burning all night till dawn and light up the whole sky in case those long-haired Achilles make a dash for home in spite of the darkness and take to the open sea. We must certainly not leave them to embark at their leisure. Let us give those fellows something to digest at home. An arrow or a sharp spear in the back as they jump on board. To teach them and other people too to think twice of the miseries of war before they attack the horse-taming Trojans. In Troy itself, let our scarred heralds call out to the young lads and the gray-haired old men to camp all around the town on the walls that the gods built us, while our women folk keep a big fire burning in every home. In addition, regular guards must be mounted to see that the enemy do not steal into the city while the troops are away. Those gallant Trojans are my orders. Let them be carried out. So much for the moment. I think we can all say, all's well. In the morning, I will announce my further dispositions to the troops. I hope and pray to Zeus and all the other gods that I shall be able to drive away those hellhounds whom the fates bring here in their black ships. It is night now. We must mount guard for ourselves as well. But at peep of dawn, we will arm and attack them fiercely at the hollow ships. Then we shall see whether the mighty Diomedes, son of Tydeus, can drive me back from the ships to the well, or whether I shall bring him down with my sharp bronze and carry off his blood-stained arms. He will learn in the morning whether he has it in him to stand up against my spear. <laughs> More likely, as tomorrow's sun goes up, he will lie bleeding in the battlefront, with half his company dead around their leader. I wish I was sure of immortality than ageless youth and glory, like Athenes or Apollos, as I am that this day will prove disastrous to the Argives. The Trojans greeted this harangue from Hector with applause. They freed their sweating horses from the yokes and tethered them with thongs, each man by his own chariot. Then they went quickly to the town and brought out oxen and fat sheep, supplying themselves at the same time with mellow wine and bread from their homes. They also collected large quantities of wood, and presently the smell of roast meat was rising to high heaven on the breeze. Thus, all night long they sat across the corridors of battle, thinking great thoughts and keeping their many fires alight. There are nights when the upper air is windless, and the stars in heaven stand out in their full splendor round the bright moon, when every mountain top and headland and ravine starts into sight, as the infinite depths of the sky are torn open to the very firmament, when every star is seen and the shepherd rejoices. Such and so many were the Trojan fires, twinkling in front of Ilium, midway between the ships and the streams of Xanthus. There were a thousand fires burning on the plain, and round each one sat fifty men in the light of its blaze, while the horses stood by their chariots, munching white barley and rye, and waiting for dawn to take her golden throne.